Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm not usually used to the, the mic here, so, um, and I tend to, my volume goes up as I talk, so at any point I need to speak up or lower, you know, just somebody in the back give me a signal. That way we can keep it comfortable for everyone. So, um, welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking about negotiating compromise, um, something I think is often missed when we're talking about InfoSec in general. It's not something that's commonly taught when you're, when you're going through a, a, an academic course. These are some of those kind of soft skills that uh, I think is really important, especially as we progress in cybersecurity. Uh, so um, hopefully there'll be a little bit of something for everyone here. Uh, to start off, I'll do the obligatory, who am I? Uh, and then I always like to have a slide of why this matters. Why am I talking about this? Why should you care? And then the classic, who's this for? And then we'll talk about, you know, what's the easy part when it comes to communicating security posture and security needs to an organization or to senior leadership, and then establish what the challenge is, you know? From there, then we can start looking at some of the solutions. What my aim here is, is to actually bring in common negotiation tactics that you probably have heard of in different industries, whether it's you know, putting an offer on a house or just other general negotiation tactics. You see these sometimes in negotiating salaries or, or other things. The, the idea is to use well-established principles and how we can apply them to cybersecurity. Because of the time, I'm going to hit six hot topics, then we'll go through some honorable mentions of some others that we probably won't have time for. Uh, then we'll go into some common pitfalls of just things that, that naturally we kind of fall into as we progress, usually in middle management, having to speak to senior leaders. Um, I'll go through my personal mantras that I have to repeatedly tell myself. Uh, and then finally, uh, <laughs> we'll end it up on a really high note and talk about the chance of failure. So who is? This is a lot of words. This is all to say I currently work in financial services and information assurance. I handle second line control testing, and I also run the Cyber Threat Intel program uh, for my company. Previously, I spent 10 years in the Air Force where I worked for a red team, and I also taught at the weapons school uh, locally here at Nellis, where I covered topics like vulnerability management, patch management, uh, MITRE attack framework. My favorite course was on social engineering and uh, open source intelligence. I have my bachelor's in computer science, and I have a SEC plus certification. I'm originally from Louisiana, as you might be able to tell. Uh, generally, what I like to talk about is game theory. And usually my talks center around strategic planning and strategic um, operations. So this is a little bit different from what I usually talk about, more on that soft skill side. And uh, my LinkedIn and Twitter's here. It's also at the end. So the great disclaimer side. So I want to start by really kind of setting the scene here. The number one answer in any kind of you know, cybersecurity infosec question is usually it depends, right? There is no clear black and white answer. It's always dependent on an environment, a budget, this particular industry, this particular person. This presentation is going to be no different. If you're looking to find a slide that you disagree with, nine times out of 10, I'll probably have at least one that you're like, mm, I'm not so sure about that. And that's completely okay. In fact, it's encouraged. The whole point of having this conversational talk on soft skills is that it's going to be opinion based. It's going to be based on my experience uh, and your experience is going to be different. The idea is I don't think that this is a topic that we talk enough about, that we have open discussions about, and I want to help facilitate by giving this presentation. So if you say, no, I tried that and it absolutely failed. That's awesome. I would love to hear it. And I, and I would encourage everyone for any kind of disagreements or agreements that you have that conversation. Let's, let's talk about the different experiences that are out there 
and ways, different ways that we've been able to problem solve and be successful or fail so that we can all kind of cross learn so that we can be more successful in general as an industry. So why does this matter? What I have found is going to conferences in the last couple of years and uh, sitting around and just talking to people that's already established in the industry, it's very interesting because there's not usually a lot of talks on the mid-management level. So people that are, have already been in for a couple of years, they've seen kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's not always a lot of mentorship in that middle management before you're getting up to senior management. So that's one thing that I really noticed. The other is what I'm seeing right now in the industry is a lot of people getting masters in cybersecurity without having a traditional maybe computer science or uh, other kind of technical bachelors. Um, in a lot of ways, I compare it to the MBA of the 70s and 80s as kind of a top off that gives you that extra edge in whatever kind of field that you're going in. Cybersecurity has become that a little bit, but it's a little against tradition. Usually your old security people were the people that were sysadmins 20 years ago. They've gone through the trenches. Now they know from a security perspective exactly, you know, for that environment, what works, what doesn't work, what makes sense. We have a lot of senior educated people that are entry level on understanding how an IT department works, how it works within a business or company construct. Um, and, and so that is a big portion of why I think that this is important. So we can kind of bridge some of that gap. Also, in my opinion, a highly successful cybersecurity professional is one that people want to come to. You don't want to be that person that's like, oh gosh, I'm going to have to tell Vanessa that we just introduced 10,000 more vulnerabilities in our system and she is going to flip out. In my opinion, that doesn't make a super effective leader. What you want is someone that you know is going to be cool headed about it as much as to be expected but be able to help you problem solve and to help you be successful, not be the parent or the manager that's like, you suck. And so I think that understanding some of these principles can help you do that. And ultimately the goal is to make the business or the company or the enterprise as a whole better. So a lot of times when we're talking about negotiation, it's me getting max value for myself but in this situation, your end goal is actually to make sure that the enterprise is as secure as possible given the challenges. You're not always going to get what you want. So sometimes when you're told no, we need to figure out a way to still achieve those goals of reducing risk for the organization without maybe getting your awesome Gucci tool that you first presented and was told no, you're not going to get that. Who's this presentation for? It's for everyone. Yeah, I mean, honestly, these are, these are common enough skills that everyone can gain some sort of insight or purpose from this. Like I said before though, that middle management, that's first, now it's time for me to help make decisions. I'm not just on, I'm not just doing the decisions that other people made. It's, it's now time for me to be able to help promote better decision making. This is primarily the audience for that. So the easy part, finding things that are wrong with processes. Um, I'm sure that plenty of people, if you've, if you've worked in IT, you show up to a place, anybody that tells you that they have a well-run IT department is either woefully ignorant or they're just absolutely lying to you so you don't run away. Like every IT department's going to have that one department, maybe two departments, maybe one team. There's going to be something that they don't do great and maybe they don't even do well at all. Maybe they do terribly. Those are kind of easy to spot, especially as somebody just walking in, right? Fresh eyes, you can immediately see, definitely this is not how it's supposed to be. Um, or, and similar to that, finding things to improve. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
this doesn't work quite right. How about we do this? Or simply threats. I work in threat intel. If I want to find threats that's going to scare the company that I'm talking to, I can find those. And I could probably find those pretty easily. So it's all about how you're presenting your message. What is it that you want to do? Do you want to scare them? Do you want to have the FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt approach? That's certainly a tactic to use. Some people do find success in that. That's the easy part. The doom and gloom is kind of the easy part, right? The challenge, of course, is having a solution and then being told it's how much? Don't we already have enough security tools out there? Didn't we just buy one like two years ago? Like, why are we buying another tool? Um, why can't we just use what we already have? We already have 10 tools. You're telling me I can't do this one thing? Pushback is going to happen. It's a very natural piece of the process. Sometimes it's part of the defensive process. But being able to explain why in a way that your audience understands so that you can be successful from a security posture perspective is, is really where the goodness lies. <coughs> All right, so here is the meat of the matter. Six techniques that I chose to talk with you today about. Um, and we'll go through each and every one and kind of talk about them a bit. Uh, like I said, this is not groundbreaking. This is not meant to be groundbreaking. This is meant to be, oh yes, of course, that makes sense. Hopefully, if I've done my job right. The first one, being excited versus being anxious. Uh, this one is near and dear to my heart because when I get excited, I get loud. My voice rises. People think that I'm yelling at them. They think that I'm out of breath, that I'm giving myself a heart attack because I'm going to talk really, really fast. But I'm just excited. Sometimes I'm just passionate about the subject. But if you go through yelling at the top of your lungs and looking like that you're angry, that is going to possibly hurt you when it comes to you trying to actually promote good decision making, depending on what solution you're choosing. So interestingly, people care more about delivery sometimes than the actual message. It's your body language. It's, it's confidence. You hear that all the time about people giving presentations and you need to be confident and, and um, you know, your voice not shake too much. A lot of the delivery is very, is very important. Part of that is actually being able to read the room, being able to see if you go in, and it could be that depending on who you're talking to, they are very motivated by a threat of, hey, th if you don't fix this vulnerability, we could be hacked tomorrow. Um, that could be very motivating, but it could be that they hear that all the time anyway. Yeah, yeah, we're always about to get hacked. So being able to read the room, know your audience, being able to read their body language, just like you're being able to read your body language, then that's very important. Yes? I just want to comment on your body language. The way you're using your hands is a very open approach. And I've seen others in your presentation where they look very defensive. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. At this point, I don't know what I'm doing with my hands. Uh, <laughs> um, and then the last point of this is reserving the extreme words for the extreme situations. So, you know, log4j, we got to figure out if we're using log4j on the system, you know. Do we have it in, in any kind of third-party dependencies? Do we have it actually in our enterprise by itself? You know, if, if not, yes, it's a big thing that's going on in the industry. Move it is also a perfect example. You know, if I'm not using move it, then I'm not using that extreme language. I'm not, I'm not promoting this as the sky is falling, as a classic chicken little example, because I'm going to reserve some of those extreme emotions for things like a ransomware incident in which we're actually being hit with ransomware. If everything is up here all the time, then how are you going to know the difference between here and here when things really are at the top of the line? Next is be cool and collected. A lot of these are going to have similarities. So obviously, be cool and collected runs in very smoothly with 
being excited versus not being anxious, right? That's, that's a part of it. This, I think, comes easier with experience over time, if nothing else, because at some point you have heard pretty much all of the extreme things that have happened. Did you know that this worker is doing this? That they were able to bypass you know, this security thing here? Like, it just gets more extreme the longer you've been in the industry. The kind of stories that you hear, um, things that are happening that you're like, no, no, surely not, yes, probably so. So over time, you're not as surprised when somebody comes to your desk or to your office um, with some sort of, did you know? Or I looked at this and I found these holes or these vulnerabilities. So I, I think that in the very least, it's something that comes over time, but it doesn't have to. It can be kind of a conscious decision. Uh, when I was creating this, I don't have any children, but I, I often hear parents talk about, you know, if, if um, their kids have an accident, if they've scraped their knee or something, instead of just being like, oh my gosh, are you okay? It's that cool and collected, just asking them, not freaking out so they don't freak out. And so that's how I kind of equate this. Um, also, expectation management can be very powerful. Uh, anybody that, that knows me has heard at least once uh, me tell them when they come to me and say, I can't believe, and I'm like, repeat after me, lower your expectations. <laughs> that sounds crazy, um, but it's powerful and it's useful. Make sure that you know, you're going into an environment and you have a real sense of how the environment is operating and you're not expecting them at this level. That doesn't mean that they can't achieve that level. It doesn't mean that you can't push them to that level, but you just need to really make sure that you understand the reality of the situation. You understand that if this situation exists, it might be because of things that are outside of their control, and they're not solely responsible for that. There's a lot of second and third order effects there. And so, by understanding some of those expectations, it's going to allow you to be able to look at the situation from a higher big picture perspective, allow you to look at it from a logical perspective instead of an emotional one as much as possible, and help you be more effective at problem solving. And then um, the last one I put on here, and looking at it, it kind of makes me laugh. Now, I am a classic overthinker. So I think of all scenarios all the time. So it's, it's from one to the extreme, you know, from I'm going to get into a wreck until an asteroid's going to like completely destroy the Earth. I have thought it all, and then at, when I'm done, I repeat them. So I always anticipate roadblocks. I think I'm going to go talk to this person and I'm going to tell them that they need to do X. And then I'm going to have all the ways in which they tell me in some form or fashion, no, screw you, and are you ridiculous? I have, I have had it all anticipated out, so then, then I can have my counter arguments. Uh, and I find that it, it helps me feel like that I'm in control of a situation, um, and it helps me feel prepared. So regardless of what somebody says, I mean, I still get surprised, don't get me wrong. But uh, for me, it helps me to be cool and collected if I feel like then I know all of the possible answers, and I already have contingencies for those situations. Bring draft solutions. Not long ago, I found out Cunningham's Law, and I find it fantastic. I love that it's, there's a name for, for this, and that is the best way to get the right answer on the internet is not to ask a question, but to post the wrong answer. And I've seen it, I've seen it a lot. Reddit is full of it, it's fantastic. Um, and I've, I've definitely done that before. When coming up with solutions, courses of action, different things to propose, uh, even in my military time, uh, if you were going through and determining three or four things that a commander or a senior leader had to choose from, you know, you had your top solution of, of what you were going to do, one of those was always going to be an absolutely crazy solution. The, you know, if we had infinite money, if we had infinite power, this is the solution. 
and it does a couple of things. One is it allows you to all agree upon that dropping a moose from a helicopter into a building to destroy that building could be effective, but is not really a reliable, applicable solution. At least we can agree on that, right? Like it's, it's, it's a classic social engineering. We're just going to pick one thing that we can agree on. We can agree on all of these things, but we can at least agree that acquiring a moose and a helicopter and dropping it from the sky is probably not our solution today, right? It helps form, you know, at least, if nothing else, it makes everybody smile for a minute. Sometimes it doesn't, and that's super awkward. But having at least a drastic solution often helps in my experience. Then you can say, okay, that one's right out. It's kind of like taking a multiple choice test. If you can mark off two of the questions and it be 50-50, then you, you feel good about that, right? You feel like the progress is made. I'm not completely stupid. I can at least bring it down to two. Kind of a similar principle here. If you can have enough solutions in which you can definitely mark a couple off and then concentrate on a couple, it kind of bridges that gap, helps with negotiation. Define the non-negotiables. I find this interesting because this is definitely terminology for what you would think of as more of a strictly business thing. It's not something that you would normally use these words to describe in a cybersecurity environment. But if you think about it, as a security professional, you do have some non-negotiables, right? You can't say, I'm just going to turn off antivirus. Like that's kind of a non-negotiable, generally speaking, you know? So you do have some things that you're not going to be willing to compromise on, and you need to know those. You need to know what you're willing to accept, but more, almost more importantly, what you're not willing to accept. Because I guarantee you, the thing is, is, is a lot of times, especially information security versus IT, sometimes it can appear adversarial. Right? You know that they're, you know, the, the old cliche, they're just trying to get out of work. They just don't want to implement it. It's too much of a pain. You know, if something goes wrong with the network, it must be the security tool. Like, those are fun things that we can joke about and, and laugh about and say, oh, yeah, you know, it's just IT just trying to skate out from work. But in reality, it's a lot more complicated than that, right? It's a classic it depends situation. Usually, people are not adversarial. Well, if Vanessa suggested it, we're definitely not going to do it. Uh, I don't think that that's very typical. So you have to understand that this is more of a, where can we reach some middle ground? And to understand that middle ground, you have to know your non-negotiables. Also, I think that it's really important to note that the answer could be no, but it also could be not right now. It might be, I use the example here of a data, la data loss prevention DLP solution, right? It might be that a business is like, we definitely need a good DLP solution. And maybe nobody disagrees with that. It could be like, you know what, you're right. But we can't do that right now. As a security professional, I think that it's important that we at least recognize or consider that a non-negotiable might be a okay for it to be a not right now. Let's add it to the roadmap. Let's add it to the next year's budget. Let's document it to make sure that it's not something that you're just telling me that like next time you're gonna be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, let's actually make a plan. It's okay if a non-negotiable has a longer term solution. It doesn't have to necessarily be a short term solution as long as there's a plan. The fair offer. The low cost, easy to implement recommendation. There's tons of those, right? <laughs> um, sometimes there is, often it's not. But if it exists, you should definitely present it. Again, it's not, I don't want you to have to create this extremely complex system that's so mature. Sometimes easy is okay. Sometimes easy to, easy to implement is always good, right? As long as it's effective. But low cost solutions, absolutely. You should absolutely um, be okay with those and 
Again, that's that olive branch of, okay, this is my fair offer. I think that this can work, um, and I think that it will be beneficial to everyone, including the business. Acknowledging unique challenges, I always think is a, is a piece of that. You can say, I understand maybe that, that this solution isn't as easy to implement because of these unique challenges, because of these legacy systems, because of these unique systems, because of these third party contingencies. Explain to them, you know, like I said, this is not a you versus them. This is let's have a conversation. I do actually understand probably more than you think, understand your unique challenges and I want to express that kind of sweetens the fare off for a little bit. They're like, you know, she just wants what's best for us. This is fair. Sometimes that can help. And again, I, I bring up this again, a temporary solution is also okay. Um, I talk a lot about if the number one solution can't be implemented, we can always talk about mitigating and compensating controls. Sometimes if you can't, sometimes you can't patch a vulnerability, right? Because a patch isn't available. So what do you do? You have a temporary solution in mitigating that vulnerability. That's okay. That's acceptable. It doesn't have to be a my way, the highway. We must be super secure right now with this kind of stringent guidelines. We can still achieve the same purpose. We can still reduce risk. Maybe we're not reducing risk at the rate that we want to, but it's still progress. So that's all part um, of the fair offer. Next is the value offer. Not completely dissimilar, but I find this to be effective because it's never just the one thing, right? It's never, here's a tool, you just have to install it. Especially in a corporate environment, there's a lot more to that, right? If nothing else, there's the contract process of acquiring a vendor, going through all of that. That's one side that I won't always volunteer for, but one that I do typically volunteer for is the documentation piece for IT. Nobody likes right, writing documentation. Nobody has time to write documentation. Nobody wants to update this. What about you know, here's the standard, how are you going to implement, where are the procedures, this could be audited, what about compliance? There's so many other little factors there that plenty of IT people, especially the ones that are on the ground, hands on keyboard, they're like, no. It's, it's like they're kryptonite, they hate documentation. So I like to offer to write documentation. Immediately that's going to make them compliant, plus they don't have to do it. Right? And if I'm doing it, then they don't have to worry about me editing it once they, if they write it and they have to get my feedback because I'm writing it, right? Which is dual purpose because then I can put those security pieces in there that I know they don't want to put in there. But if I'm writing it, then I have an opportunity to put some of those things in there. So to me, it's, it's very much a win-win and documentation to me is my most successful value offer in that. But it could also be sometimes it's whatever kind of limited resource it is. Maybe in some departments, you can transfer some of your budget money to that department if they're low on funds. Maybe it's, I have a couple of analysts that would like to get some hands-on experience with um, some of that troubleshooting or installing that tool. Maybe I can offer up those people if they don't have enough people to be able to complete that task. So there's several different ones that you use. Um, like I said, documentation usually is a winner uh, for me. Honorable mentions. So these all follow a, a very similar pattern to all the others, right? You could give very similar arguments to these and just call them different things. Um, and that's, that's kind of the beauty of some of these tactics and techniques. It's again, knowing whatever speaks to you. Maybe one of the other ones you're like, eh, I'm not sure, but focus on the win-win. You're like, that I can understand. You know, so um, ask for advice. For a lot of people, sometimes I think 
we get the reputation of we walk into a room and we think we're an expert on security and we're here to tell you how much you're not going to be able to implement your plan because of security. But if we walk into a room and we hear your pitch and then we ask for advice, what would you like to do? Not like to do, but what would you do in this situation? People often respond to that. I've met a lot of IT people that are not in security, but they study security. They have their opinions about security. It's not like they're completely ambivalent to that world. They're reading the news. Maybe they're studying for certs. They have some knowledge about security already. So if you talk to them like a peer and you say, you know, what do you think about this? My idea is implementing these kind of uh, security things, that's going to, to make it feel like more of a team environment and much less of me barking at you things that's going to make your plan impossible to implement. Use language that your audience understands. I can give a whole talk just on that because a lot of times tech people, they want to talk shop, they want to talk technical details, and they want to tell it to someone who's not from a tech background that really doesn't really care. You don't have to pull out the Excel spreadsheet. It's, it's, you can just tell them in layman terms, but you have to know what that common language is. I use the example of risk and impact because I have found that um, a lot of people on the IT side don't necessarily cage their situation in terms of risk and impact. And because of that, but you have whole business departments that are dedicated to risk. From a business perspective, inherent risk, residual risk, um, determine, determining um, your what the actual money amount that you might lose from an impact. Generally speaking, operations, IT operations, doesn't have to do a lot of those calculations, but a lot of business people do. So if you can come in with a threat, with a, we need to implement a new solution now, and this is why, if you cage it in terms of risk and impact, then I think that your success rate significantly improves. But like I talked about before, you gotta know what that sweet spot is. You gotta know who you're talking to um, and, and maybe what some of their, their industry jargon is and then apply it so that, that you understand and they understand the same thing. Focus on the win-win. I think that's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, understand the big picture. It's really easy in an IT environment to get in the weeds. When, especially if you're talking about something like incident response and you're down in the trenches and you're trying to quarantine systems and remediate and bring down this segment and when do we bring this up and backups and all of this, you can totally get in the weeds. Understanding the bigger picture, seeing it from a broader perspective, maybe seeing it from a business continuity perspective or just a business perspective in general often helps. Um, when it comes to solutions. Again, still taking in some of those other principles, making sure that you recognize the challenges, you recognize the work that's, being ha that's happening here, but when it comes to trying to get people to make better broad decisions, bringing in that big picture is definitely going to help. Uh, and the last one, make negotiations about the other team. This is a classic, I'm trying to help you, and you're letting them maybe make things that are in their own self-interests, but if you combine a couple of these principles, like going through um, and having your non-negotiables and, and making it feel like that they have the power, that they're influencing you and your decision-making, and not making it one-sided is also going to help you be effective. Common pitfalls. Some of these are kind of general, um, like building reports with no recommendations. From a security perspective, everything should definitely have recommendations, and that's going to help with that decision-making piece. If you have recommendations, then that's going to help facilitate the next discussion, which is how would you like to implement those recommendations, right? 
But if you don't have, if you're, if you're only what feels like barking information, that's going to create kind of a stonewall effect. Distributing reports with no follow-up. Um, again, I put on here, making sure that you document a plan, if there is a plan. Making sure that you're not sending reports for the sake of sending reports. You're not sending them into the ether, and then if somebody says, did so-and-so read it, be like, I sent the reports. Follow through is very, and follow up is very important here. Making sure that whatever you, that it is that you decide on, it's kind of funny, in a meeting, in a, in a small meeting room with people at a table, sometimes people will agree to anything, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep, we can totally do that. If you don't follow through, you don't maybe publish meeting minutes, or you don't actually document and say, here's the plan and here's how we're going to do this, here's our way forward, then in some ways it's as good as not having agreed to it at all. Yes, sir. I, I think that reading people is definitely an advantage for that. And, and over time, you get to know your colleagues and you get to know the people that will do anything just to be able to get out of that meeting, for sure. Um, but I, I also think that it's important that you don't, you don't ever call out those kind of people. You just adjust your tactics. You don't actually, like, you don't want to point that out. You don't want to, to make them embarrassed in any way so instead you just change up some of your tactics and you know if you have somebody that's like yes yes absolutely that's no problem let's go and then leave I, that's where I find that maybe the meeting minutes is particularly useful so and so said this it's timed it's bulleted ways forward I need this report I'm going to send this list it, it makes them more accountable because it's in writing uh, another pitfall is always bringing up the negative. I think that's super easy to do because all we do is read about all of the horror stories and the breaches that are happening and the data leaks and oh my gosh, did you hear about this story? It's super easy to always bring up the negative uh, and sometimes it can be really discouraging because it feels like, whether it's accurate or not, we can have that discussion. Um, that defense is really, really hard right now, and we're not necessarily winning the war. And sometimes that can be really um, discouraging to a lot of people, that even if you remediate this, there's only another one right around the corner. It's not something that we should really focus on. Even though it's easy to, we don't need to be Eeyores here, or Chicken Littles. Um, so as much as you can bring up more positive things or ways that, that we're still progressing in security posture, I highly encourage that. Um, and the next one, not acknowledging progress. Um, I think that that's extremely important, especially in a program that's really difficult, that they've gone through the ringer and made huge strides. Instead of saying, but they still have this far to go, instead of concentrating on all the work that they've done, it is super important. Ultimately, you want people to feel good about the progress that they've made. It's going to help them want to progress even more. Nobody wants to be told, hey, I finished this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working on this, and I've worked really hard, and it's like, yeah, but you still have a really long way to go. Like, it's really important that you acknowledge where we've come from. And it's hard to see that sometimes. It's part of the understanding of the big picture, is being able to say, you know, we started here, look at all the things that we've implemented in such a short period of time. And then settling with a us versus them mentality, again, very easy to do. Your IT, you just don't want to, you know, install security stuff and you're just, and your security and you're just here to make my life harder um, because that's just how you are, you know. Definitely separating from that, realizing we're one team, one fight uh, is definitely going to help you be successful. So, my personal mantras. One is one that my boss uh, brought up to me, and sometimes uh, it's really difficult for me to do, and that is just to let things go. 
it's easy to like hone in on an issue and you want some sort of resolution. You want somebody to acknowledge, yes, it's a problem. Yes, you're going to fix it. This is the timeline that you're going to fix it. Here are the tickets and, and everything is going to be great and we'll check it on it in two weeks and it's done. And maybe that's not possible. Maybe they don't even think that it's a really big issue. Maybe they're like, you know what? We accept that. It's fine. And you're like, but you shouldn't. <laughs> Maybe, maybe it's okay that they do. Again, maybe for a short period of time, or maybe we can bring this up later. But sometimes, oftentimes, you're not gonna get the answer that you're looking for. You're not going to have somebody be like, you are so absolutely right. We're going to put 10 people on it right now, and it'll be fixed by the end of the day. So sometimes, you just have to know when to let things go. And if it's a big enough issue, you know it's gonna come back up again. Maybe you'll just bring it up the next time. But it's okay sometimes to let things go. And if you have a really hard problem doing that, then find somebody that can remind you that sometimes you just need to let it go. And sometimes this is really useful when there's a personnel conflict, when maybe it's not an issue. You just feel like that there's a person that's just saying no all the time, and they're stopping you from what you think is progress. Sometimes you still just have to let it go. Sometimes it's, it's, it's that classic, I don't want you to do this thing, I want you to want to do that thing. So like the classic thing is, I don't want you to do the dishes, I want you to want to do the dishes, right? Like sometimes I feel like that that's how security is. It's like, I don't wanna have to bark orders and say, you have to do this, I want you to be able to come up with this on your own and then to be able to say, hey, this is what we want to do because it's better from a security perspective. You're not going to get that always. Sometimes you're never going to get that. So you just need to recognize that. That's one of my personal mantras. The second is considering strategy over procedure. I will totally get in the mental weeds on what steps need to be done when. And from, especially from in my environment where I'm on a second line perspective, This is more of a consulting. This is not an operations. I'm not touching anything, even though I want to, because I know that I can just go over there, and in 10 minutes, I can fix it. But that's not my job. I need to worry more about the strategy piece, the standard, the what needs to be established, and then let the teams that are actually doing the work actually concentrate on the how. And that's a really difficult thing for me to do, but when it works, I think it works beautifully. All right, so the happy bonus slide. Always consider that there is a chance of failure. It's possible that nobody disagrees with you. You give your whole pitch and everybody's like, yes, absolutely. Nobody says no. You know, nobody says I disagree. Nobody says I think you're overreacting. They're like, yeah, that's, that's absolutely legit. But maybe we can't do it right now. Or this doesn't fit for this budget cycle. You can do all the right things. You can read the room, you can use the right language, you can have the fair offer, you can all that and still be told no. And it's important that you recognize that. It doesn't mean that you personally failed. It doesn't even necessarily mean that your initiative has failed, but you're going to definitely be confronted with failure at some point. And it's important that to realize that that's not the end all be all. You have to know what to do after failure. Larger projects and initiatives might need to be put on the back burner, but like I said before, don't miss an opportunity to bring them up again. This is great as part of our MFA initiative that we plan on implementing next quarter. Those can all be pieces to that puzzle that you can implement. And in my opinion, never um, always use the opportunity to combine it with other initiatives that people are, uh, that are already well established that people are already used to. People are used to audits. Um, they're, they're used to maybe PCI compliance or other pieces of compliance, GDPR, things like that. If you have a security piece that you can apply to an initiative or a compliance issue that the business is already used to carrying that weight on, then you should definitely combine it with that. It will help mull over what it is that you're trying to do a little bit easier. All right, and that's what I got. Uh, We talked about the convincing other teams 
senior leadership, non-IT departments, um, on different soft skills. Leading with FUD is not always the best solution. Using classic negotiation tips can certainly help um, when it comes to promoting better security practices. And realize that even with all the right tools, it's possible to not be successful, but the important piece is, is to always keep trying. And that's what I got for y'all today. Does anybody have any questions? All right, thank you. Oh, do I need to put that back up? Oh, look at that. It's not even going to come up now. <laughs> Figures. Now you get to see my camping in Santa Fe. My happy place. And it still doesn't work. Oh, there it goes. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Appreciate it. Yes.